tonight. They were trapped overnight as a snowstorm slammed BC South Coast. Watch out! Thousands stranded in their cars, power cut, and the danger isn't over yet. The new drug raising new hope for Alzheimer's patients. It's not a cure, it's a step in the right direction. Why it could come with a risk. And landlords and renters talk face to face about the reality of Canada's housing crisis. We have to live in this constant um, just disarray. Do you have any advice? I mean, as a landlord? There are cheaper parts of the, the country to, to live in. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us tonight. Many BC residents are again being warned to be careful out on the roads. The temperature is falling and ice is at risk after a wicked snowstorm. Snow blanketed southwestern BC, turning travel into a nightmare for many. Crashes and gridlock left people stuck for hours. So the snow fell fast and right as so many people were hitting the road. Renee Filipponi shows us the frustrating, at times dangerous, moments that followed. The snow was in the forecast for days, but that didn't prevent chaos on the roads across the region. Accidents shut down major routes, such as the Alex Fraser Bridge, and left people stranded in their cars for hours. I'm going one kilometer per hour. Surrey resident Derville Lowe recorded some of his more than eight hour commute from New Westminster. It would normally take less than an hour. So as the snow came on and started piling up, it was wet and everybody was started skidding. He says the experience was frustrating and exhausting. The city would have gotten the forecast. Mm -hmm. I think they didn't expect it to happen so quickly. The situation was so bad, volunteers from a sick Gudwara near one of the blocked bridges jumped into action. They just make some refreshments, some uh, sort of dinner and they just taken the whole dinner to the Queensboro Bridge. The province says contractors were out in full force to keep things clear, but also got stuck in traffic. Our, our contractors, as well as our own ministry staff, are, are currently debriefing from last night's event to see if there are any concrete changes that we can be making. I'm giving up and going home, so not the best. By morning, transit riders were experiencing delays with many buses stuck and abandoned overnight. I know it's really chaotic right now and everyone's doing their best, um, but it did feel like we kind of expected the snow, so I'm a little surprised that we're still kind of figuring things out as it happens. The northern part of Vancouver Island was hardest hit. Some areas saw up to 25 centimeters of snow. A lot of the vehicles we removed this morning did not have winter tires. Um, they probably should not have been traveling over the Malahat. The storm took out power to tens of thousands across the region as heavy, wet snow froze on power lines. And schools in much of the Fraser Valley were also shut down. And Renee, I guess first came the snow, now the brand new concern, right? Well, temperatures for most of the region throughout the day were above freezing. There was sunshine, there was melt and slush. It's getting cold now and it will get colder overnight. So things will ice up, making for a potentially slippery and dangerous commute tomorrow morning. The next snowfall is in the forecast for Friday. Adrian. All right, Renee Filipponi in a snowy Vancouver. Thanks, Renee. You're welcome. Reaction continues to pour in tonight after Alberta's premier tabled her new Sovereignty Act. Justin Trudeau says he's waiting to see what happens next. We're going to see how this plays out. Uh, I'm not going to take anything off the table, but I'm also not looking for a fight. Premier Danielle Smith says the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act is a way to push back against Ottawa by refusing to enforce federal legislation or policies deemed, quote, harmful to Alberta. It would give her cabinet new powers to amend provincial laws without legislative debate. Trudeau says Albertans are concerned about those, quote, exceptional powers. There's some major medical news tonight for anyone affected by Alzheimer's. For the first time, a new drug shows promise in slowing the progression of the disease. As Mike Crawley tells us now, that could buy some people more time and more dignity. So this is the medication. It's the experimental Alzheimer's drug lecanemab. Okay. Tested in a worldwide human trial, including at this Toronto clinic. Totally painless. 
The drug is developed jointly by two pharma companies, Biogen of the U.S. and ASI of Japan. New results just published in the New England Journal of Medicine show lecanemab did what no other drug has done. It slowed the worsening of early Alzheimer's symptoms. People have more preserved functioning or preserved thinking uh, for a longer period of time. On this scale, measuring severity of dementia, the average participant started out here. Over the 18-month trial, those who got the placebo deteriorated more than those treated with lecanemab. It could mean more personal autonomy for people with early-stage Alzheimer's, more time being able to drive or looking after their own banking. So those are some examples of some things that could be retained if there's a slowing of progression. The companies have not announced how much lecanemab will cost, although ASI's chief executive says it will be affordable. But there are also safety concerns. Two of the 1,800 patients in the trial died after they were given other medication to break up blood clots. The risk of either bleeding or swelling in the brain was 20 percent. That's a high, high number. Dr. Donald Weaver, a Canadian neurologist, is not involved in lecanemab, and he calls the drug an important beginning. It's not a cure. Uh, we're nowhere near uh, that yet. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. The pharma companies are asking the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to give lecanemab rapid approval. A decision is expected in early January. They have not submitted the drug to Health Canada for review, but say they intend to do so as soon as possible. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Ontario have a warning for parents tonight. Child exploitation is on the rise. So that caution comes as officials announce a massive province-wide investigation. A total of 428 charges were laid against 107 people as part of this project. Now those results are just from October alone. The charges range from making or possessing child pornography to luring children and sexual assault. 61 victims were identified and more charges could still be laid. So police are urging parents not to let kids use phones or computers unsupervised. A former top police official in the UK confirms Meghan Markle faced some serious threats and that those threats were both very real and disgusting. Abby Koavasan now with the new revelations and who is to blame. <laughs> They last returned home to say goodbye to the Queen. But before that, Prince Harry admitted he worried about Meghan Markle's safety in the UK. That long-standing fear began years ago when their relationship first became public in 2016. Now, confirmation, the concern was valid. We have teams investigating it. People have been prosecuted for those threats. In an exclusive interview with Britain's Channel 4 News, the outgoing counterterrorism chief at London's Metropolitan Police revealed Markle's life was in danger and much of the hate was rooted in right-wing extremism. The kind of rhetoric that's online, if you don't know what I know, you would feel under threat all of the time. The Duchess of Sussex spoke out about the racist and violent vitriol she experienced in an interview with Oprah last year. She said other members of the royal family didn't face these types of attacks. In London, some people felt she'd been vindicated by the new revelations. It's good that she's finally getting recognized as this is an actual issue. That's not surprised with the way that people have been treating her in this country. The couple lost taxpayer-funded police protection after stepping away from royal duties in 2020. Prince Harry has been trying to restore it, even offering to pay for it himself. The British government has not allowed it, but this past summer he gained permission to legally challenge that decision. The Met investigations may explain why the prince wanted its officers to protect his family, says this royal commentator. It's about the level of intelligence that the Metropolitan Police had that he wanted to still have access to and he wanted to still tap into. The outgoing Met official says the far-right extremism is the fastest growing threat in the United Kingdom, a threat that directly targeted a member of the royal family. Abby Kovas in CBC News, London. Prince William's godmother is apologizing tonight and has resigned from her position as a royal aide after allegedly making racist remarks. At a recent event, Susan Hussey, who worked for the royal family for nearly 60 years, repeatedly asked black advocate Ngozi Fulani what part of Africa she was from. Despite Fulani saying she was born in the UK, Hussey kept asking. The palace described the comments as unacceptable and deeply regrettable, 
A spokesperson for Prince William said racism has no place in our society. William and Kate are in Boston right now, kicking off a three-day visit to the city. As Chris Reyes explains, it's a working trip focused on the environment and the future of the British monarchy. The Prince and Princess of Wales lit Boston City Hall green, the colour a nod to the trip's purpose, to host the Earthshot Prize, launched by Prince William to find solutions to repair the planet. The city, chosen for its connection to John F. Kennedy and his famous speech about putting men on the moon. It was that moonshot speech that inspired me to launch the Earthshot Prize with the aim of doing the same for climate change as President Kennedy did for the space race. The royals are expected to stick to that message, meeting local climate activists leading up to Friday's awards ceremony. In a last minute ad, the couple will also meet US President Joe Biden. This is William and Kate's first overseas visit since the Queen's death. A lot could rest on it. Following the couple's tour of the Caribbean earlier this year, this is our land. where they were met with protests. They want to align themselves um, with a certain way of thinking, um, a broad mindset, an educated mindset. So I think Boston is important in that way. Um, but they also want to be actively working on how they're presenting themselves to the global community. That includes who they celebrate. I think what's interesting is, is there's a real you know, focus on the diversity of some of the finalists as well this year. And I think that's that's a message that they're very keen to, to get across. At the Royals Hotel, signs a couple has star power on American soil, with fans waiting in the rain to catch a glimpse. It all happened so fast, but it's exciting. Fans, influence, relevance, all key to the survival of a monarchy at a definitive turning point in its history. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. A new generation of U.S. Democrats have taken over in Congress after the nomination of the new minority House leader, Hakeem Jeffries. Young people, seniors, immigrants, veterans, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, the least, the lost, and the left behind, House Democrats fight for the people. Jeffries will be the first black American to lead any party in Congress. He replaces outgoing Speaker Nancy Pelosi as Republicans take control of the House in January. So a top priority for the Democrats before that happens, securing more funding for Ukraine, where tonight the brutal fighting continues to rage. Some of the worst of it is taking place in the country's east, in the small city of Bakhmut. That's where both Ukraine and Russia have suffered major losses. And Chris Brown shows us the scope of the destruction in that city, the loss of life, and why both sides appear to be digging in so hard. Bakhmut has been pulverized by Russian fire for six long months. Despite major defeats, Russia has been unrelenting at trying to capture the city in the Donbass. Its troops are pressing closer than ever. What can we do if Putin is so stupid, said this resident, who somehow endures here? Doesn't he have enough land? The war here has descended into a muddy, wretched mess. Soldiers shoot at each other from trenches and foxholes. And just outside the city, Russians try to dodge grenades dropped on top of them by Ukrainian drones. It's remind me a uh, situation of the First World War. Retired Ukrainian Colonel Sergei Grabsky says Russia is using century-old tactics, sending waves of conscripted men, paid mercenaries, and even drafted prisoners to their deaths. Putin wants a victory, he says, and the body count doesn't matter. There is only one option where that success may be shown because it was a political target, and they must do that. Ukraine's losses in Bakhmut may be 50 to 100 dead every day, say analysts. Russian numbers could be four times that. The situation on the front line is difficult, acknowledged President Vladimir Zelensky. Ukraine has given up ground and may pull back further. The question is, how much of a setback will that be? Perhaps not much says this analyst. The losses that the Russian troops have sustained in the effort to take Bakhmut over the course of four, five, six months 
really outweigh the strategic benefit of taking Bakhmut. By wearing down the Russian forces in Bakhmut, the Ukrainians may hope it weakens their hold on occupied territory elsewhere and opens the way for new offenses. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. The former head of the failed cryptocurrency exchange, FTX, spoke tonight making a rare video appearance. Nisha Patel now with how is he, how he is explaining a dramatic downfall that cost people millions. CEO, billionaire, cryptocurrency genius. Sam Bankman-Fried held all those titles just a month ago. Not anymore. I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. Appearing virtually from the Bahamas, Bankman Freed spoke on video for the first time since his company's sudden collapse. There were oversight failures, transparency failures. This is the future. FTX was one of the world's largest digital currency exchanges for people to buy, sell, hold or trade crypto. At its peak, it was valued at $32 billion. I'm getting into crypto with FTX. You in? There were convincing paid endorsements from celebrities. If there's ever a place I could be that I'm not going to get in trouble, it's going to be at FTX. FTX had powerful backers like Silicon Valley heavyweight Sequoia Capital and even the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Millions bought in. It's a lot easier to, you know, just go to one of these websites, click a few buttons and congratulations, you own some Bitcoin. Then a few weeks ago, amid questions about FTX's financial stability, panicked customers withdrew billions of dollars. FTX filed for bankruptcy. People who didn't get their money out in time are suing. That money I had put aside for my granddaughter so I can use for Christmas, and now I have to figure out another way to do it. Now U.S. regulators are investigating whether FTX misused customer funds. And some question Bankman Freed's claims it was just a mistake. Imagining people are giving me uh, the responsibility of billions of dollars and the idea of just going, whoops, I forgot what account I put that into. But with millions still missing and many calling for him to end up behind bars, Bankman Freed's message now may bring little comfort. I screwed up. Like, I was CEO. I, I was the CEO of FTX. And I mean, I would say this again and again, that that means I had a responsibility. A stunning fall from grace for someone once hailed as the king of crypto. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. The tributes are coming in tonight for singer-songwriter Christine McVie. The velvet voice behind some of Fleetwood Mac's biggest hits has died at the age of 79. For you, the sun will be shining. That was McVie with Songbird from the band's seminal album Rumors. McVie joined in the early 1970s and was a powerful creative influence. She became a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer in 1998 and in later years continued to perform with Fleetwood Mac. Her family says she passed away peacefully after a brief illness. Upon hearing the news, bandmate Stevie Nicks posted to social media she wasn't even aware her friend was ill till just days ago and never got the chance to sing her a farewell song. Canadians now have another choice for streaming. Free ad-supported television is here. Well, this won't have a skip button. That's fine. Yeah. You can do that. <laughs> and Andrew returns with a fast new show. And what can I say? Bananas are king. Plus the tug of war between renters and landlords. It is approaching a national disaster. The challenges on both sides of that table. And Canada leads the G7 for the most educated workforce. But for some, getting the work they're qualified for remains a struggle. I applied for uh, more than 30 family medicine departments. We're back in two. New census numbers out tonight from StatsCan shows Canada's workforce has got talent. More than 57% of the working age population in Canada has a post-secondary degree. That is the highest proportion in the G7. So that's good news for a country facing a shortage of skilled workers. But dig into the numbers like Deanna Sumanak Johnson did and you'll find there's a hitch. If Canada's highly educated workforce stands out, a big reason is recent immigrants. 
According to Statistics Canada, nearly 60% of those newcomers hold a bachelor's degree or higher. But a lot of that talent and training isn't being used. So we're facing a lot of challenges. Ayman Jibril and his wife were doctors in Yemen. They passed qualifying exams here, but still aren't practicing. I applied for uh, more than 30 uh, family medicine departments and internal medicine for training programs in all over the country. Like, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't get any uh, chance to, to be in the system. More than 25% of recent immigrants are working jobs they're overqualified for. A paradox because it's often education that opened Canada's doors in the first place, says this expert. You qualified on the basis of your degree and your expertise. And yet then when you come here, the paradox is it's actually very difficult to find employment within that sector. That's because these jobs also often require placements, internships, residencies. Yes, the often cited example is doctors, but also nurses, also teachers. These are all um, professions that have uh, their own colleges within the different provinces and have their own certifications. And for that reason, equivalency is very difficult for um, certain uh, people in certain professions to gain. But amidst the shortage of doctors and healthcare workers across the country, changes are already underway. BC is easing some requirements for foreign trained doctors like Jabril, allowing them to work as associate physicians under the supervision of an attending doctor. And the province is also tripling the number of spots in its program designed to place foreign trained doctors where they're needed most. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. The census also shows the proportion of students in New Brunswick in French immersion is among the highest in Canada. And yet New Brunswick is phasing that program out starting next year. As Kate McKenna explains, that's leaving a lot of parents concerned, even outraged. Rebecca Davis says her plans for her son's education are tumbling down. Everything we're hearing has us really concerned for our little guy who's starting school within the next two or so years. An Anglophone in Canada's only bilingual province, Davis says French immersion is non-negotiable for her kids. I just feel that our responsibility as parents is to give our children every opportunity that we didn't have ourselves and I want to make sure that there's never a door closed to them. She was gobsmacked last month when New Brunswick's education minister resigned, revealing government plans to abolish French immersion by next year. What kind of guinea pig system are we going to subject our children to next? The government says current students can stay in immersion. And for incoming students, it will introduce a new program that gives all students basic French. We're going to have a quality program that's going to achieve the goal of conversational French. But the government released few details. It's embarrassing that the province of New Brunswick, Canada's only officially bilingual province, is abolishing French immersion. New Brunswick's French immersion program has been the subject of debate now for more than a decade. A report from earlier this year says it created a two-tiered education system, with immersion attracting the strongest students, leaving English classrooms at a disadvantage. But immersion is important for Rebecca Davis's daughter, who believes bilingualism opens doors. In the future, I can like do different jobs that I want to do that and don't limit myself to one language. And she's calling on the government to give other New Brunswick kids the same opportunity. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Moncton, New Brunswick. Rising interest rates are putting the squeeze on both renters and landlords, and it's rough. 20 years ago, you would have been able to move and found, find something comparable in your price point in your neighborhood. I, yes, exactly. It doesn't exist anymore. I get perspectives and solutions from both sides. Plus... Well, I'm not delivering this baby by myself. An arrival on the side of a highway. Whether you own or rent, it is impossible to miss the surging costs of shelter. Toronto is an extreme case. Rents are up 24%. And across the country, interest costs on a mortgage are up 11%. It can be hard to keep a roof over your head without the walls closing in. Worried landlords and tenants sometimes get mad at each other. So we thought we would bring them together to talk and maybe think solutions. 
Nicole, this is your house, so thank you for, for letting us be here. What's your situation? Um, so pre-COVID mm -hmm. um, pandemic, I um, had sold my home and went into the rental market. My goal was to be in the rental market for two years and then purchase a home. Price of homes um, skyrocketed. And um, unfortunately, the um, landlords of this place wanted to seize that opportunity. To sell this place? To sell this house, um, which put me in a predicament. I'm looking for another rental unit, which I guarantee will be 500 to thousand dollars more than what I'm paying today. You got in that trap and I don't think you're alone in that of not being able to get back into the market and and now kind of afraid you're gonna lose your rental home. Mike, you, you're also a renter yeah. who's also trying to hang on to his place, right? Um, yeah, about two years ago, uh, our, my building was thrusted into a, a project where another building was to be um, put up in the parking lot and that process has just um, seemed to you know, been bulldozed through every tenant um, with no care of the, you know, the living standards. There's excessive noise like between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Saturday and holidays even, like holiday Mondays. Mm. The response back from the, the management company and their words in the letter is, take us to court. If you don't like it, <laughs> wow. take me to court. So you feel like you're being pushed out? Yeah, 100%. My, my rent's very affordable there. Yeah. Um, I think that that's part of the, the push. It, like, it looks as if they're, they want me and any of the, the previous tenants, they want us out. My, my rent now, if I was to leave, would be more than double to the new tenant moving to, in. To, oh, oh, really? Like I, I'm paying fifteen eighty. It's on their website, it's thirty thirty two ninety five for my unit. Yeah, so that feels out of reach. Wow. Yeah. Toshek, you're a homeowner, mm -hmm. but but things are not great. I have one property that I have rented mm -hmm. out. And uh, what happens is this year, um, I got a tenant that moved in and started to not pay rent. And that has been going on for months. Uh, it's just becoming difficult and more difficult as every month goes by. And there is no end to it. I am tapping into different sources of financing this situation, which is literally high interest rate line of credits and HELOCs and whatever I can do, and try to survive. So, so are, are you considering selling? Who will buy a property with a tenant who's not moving out? Okay, right? so what is your situation? It's different, right? Yeah, so um, I am more than a regular mom and pop landlord. I have several buildings. I've been a landlord for almost two mm -hmm. decades now and have several properties. Again, um, they're all leveraged. It's a bit scary um, because I have my, my strategy, my whole net worth really is in real estate and it's about leveraging itself to buy more properties to build mm -hmm. to, you know, build more, right? So the thing that's really hurting me right now is the interest rates. And, and are your properties uh, market-based prices or rent control? What's happening? Uh, most of them are rent controlled and I'm not against rent control. Obviously, as a landlord, I prefer not to have rent control and mm -hmm. have, have the right to be able to, to uh, raise the rent if I needed to, but I don't raise the rents personally. You don't raise the rent? I, I do do the small nominal increases, which is for 2023 is 2.5%, yes. which is very minor. Mm -hmm. It's but not I, small if it's, if it's your rent and everything else is going up. But at the same time, my mortgage is going up, my tax is going up, mm -hmm. I just got my municipal tax bill <clears> or, or assessment, and that just went up by 26%. Not to mention maintenance fees or maintenance costs, mm -hmm. taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Everything just keeps going up. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of questions about that. W listening in here, obviously, is Armenia easy. Where would you rate housing in terms of, of urgency right now in this country? Um, I would say it is approaching a national disaster. We've been kind of inflation obsessed this year uh, around the world. What started off as a supply issue has continued to be a supply issue and nowhere is that more poignant than in the housing market in Canada where we just are not building enough. Insufficient supply means rising costs, rising rents, rising mortgage costs, rising interest rates. We just are not building enough to make sure that if you need to leave where you're living, there is a place for you to move to. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing cheaper out there. Well, to that point, I was thinking about you, Mike, this notion of feeling pushed out. I mean, what, what is somebody supposed to do if, if your rental unit, you just get the feeling they're trying to get you out? <clears throat> In my situation, uh, <laughs> I push back right up to that line because it's my life. This is my kids' life. Both kids are in high school. Um, a couple years left for them. I don't, I don't want to uproot them. 
we have to live in this constant um, just disarray. Do you have any advice for Mike? I mean, as a landlord? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there are cheaper parts of the, the country to, to live in, and I know it's not easy to move. Um, but to address the comment earlier where you said that your rent has pretty much doubled over the past... No, so no. Not, not my rent. Most people have. Right? Sorry, the, the current new, rent the versus... Tenant. You could say the same thing for housing as, as an owner, right? The costs yeah. have more than doubled in the past, whatever, you know, yeah. two, 10 years, right? I say with rent controls, it's the same thing, though, right? Because if you look at what inflation is, 6 7%, mm -hmm. 8%, but yet our increase is only 2.5%, and it's been like this for decades. To your point, Ken, people can move. Yeah, people can move, but people live in communities. And what do you do, especially if you're raising a family? What we're seeing, uh, and this has been going on for a few years now, is fewer owners, more renters across Canada. But the actual carrying costs for a renter, you can double rents right now because where are you gonna move to? There isn't anything out there, there isn't any supply. And so where is the supply going to now? I mean, you drive up to your neighborhood here, there's construction everywhere. There are, there are new buildings constantly. It yeah. depends on who buys them, right? Mm -hmm. We have two people yeah. sitting at this table here who bought housing to be able to have an, an income mm -hmm. stream who are small players. But the really important thing that we need to think about is that from 2016 to 2021, we lost 370,000 affordable rental units across the country. Where'd they go? Uh, they just became more expensive. 20 years ago, you would have been able yeah. to move and found, find something comparable in your price point in your neighborhood. I, yes, exactly. It doesn't exist anymore. So if you're a landlord, though, or a developer, what's your incentive to build affordable housing? Well, there isn't one. No landlord that is going to be able to build more affordable housing as interest rates rise. So let's, let's look at the future here. What do you need and what do you see coming? I mean, plan? definitely I, I still teeter-totter between the purchasing and the renting. It's great if, if the housing market comes back to, you know, a detached home for 600K, no problem. I can put that down payment in <laughs> and I'm moving in. So at this point, what's comforting for me and what I know I can handle is the rental market. Hmm. The only fear is the landlord coming to me and saying, I'm ready to sell again. To get the house down to where you want it to be, the economy is going to have to dis be destroyed. That's a question I have to ask. Is the small landlord paying for, for the, um, the tenant to stay there forever, perpetually? Mm -hmm. Right? At, at what, Great question. Right? Because it's, as a landlord, why can't I sell when I want to? Right? You can, and it isn't your job to make affordable housing reality. That's right. Mm -hmm. It is right. not, you know, you're, do you're doing nothing illegal. It's a completely legitimate business venture. Where we are falling down is public policy. Well, you have the multi-billion dollar, you know, um, developers um, that are just swooping in. Like you said, they'll purchase whatever it is that they want to purchase, whether it be a, a single home or, or full plots of land to build, you know, uh, high rises. Why aren't we looking for them for the help? Well, there is. Uh, so there's inclusionary zoning that's happening in our city, in, in Toronto, that is. I don't know about the rest of the other provinces mm -hmm. as well, too, but you have to dedicate a certain portion to affordable housing. But guess who's paying for that? It's the end purchasers. The big story is we don't have enough supply. You can't just build condos for rich people, right? That was <laughs> but, the point. <laughs> but what? We missed that boat. We've missed that boat in the last 20 years. Because a developer won't build if there's no profit. <laughs> what is the best idea you have heard or seen around the world for helping out with housing? The zoning issues are huge because you can take the stock of housing you've got and actually put it, you know, do double duty. With that? that means like laneway homes in Toronto, for example. For example, you've talked about inclusionary zoning, right. but you, there's also rezoning yeah. so that we can densify. I mean, mm -hmm. just coming to this place, so much of this area out here is one story tall. Right. Right. You could be building another story on top of it and it could be all affordable housing. I completely appreciate the discussion around what can be done in a, a bit of a future sort of a planning perspective. but. What can be done today for those who are bleeding today? Because I can't survive 15 years waiting mm -hmm. for this to be resolved. And so LTV needs to deliver what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. an efficient system in place to deal with issues when they arise. Mm -hmm. Because what happens ultimately as a small landlord, either I start to consider getting out of the market or start to consider hold on to not renting it. Right, so, so there's, there's no satisfaction with the landlord-tenant bureau at either end, landlord or tenant. Mm -hmm. 
No, it seems it's, like it's, it's it worth. seems like COVID is creating an excuse to take a step back and. And you, Mike, what do you need? What do you see coming? My future uh, uh, looks like uh, my kids will finish high school, and and then we'll leave the city. You'll you'll just get out. Yeah, we'll we'll look to purchase, but it'll it'll be outside of the city. It'll be, you know, an hour or two hours away. If you want to look at the future, you look at other major cities, Hong Kong, San Fran, et cetera, et cetera, London, Paris, it's a renter nation. I'm not saying that's mm -hmm. a, you know, that everybody has to come to terms with that. It's just, it's just what it is, right? It's wealth passed down through generations. And it's just a fundamental issue with capitalist society. We can't solve that here, but this is a good start. So Ken, Tojek, Nicole, Mike, and Armin, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you very much. So this cost of living crisis is not going away. We want to hear your stories and also wherever you've got them, your solutions. So please get in touch by Instagram or over email, thenational at cbc.ca. And after the break, there's another service vying for your streaming time. I spend too much time watching TV. Television goes back to the future with the familiar face at the helm. Hey there, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That. Free ad-supported television enters the streaming wars. Next. Tonight, there's a new way to watch CBC News. We've launched a new 24-7 streaming channel called CBC News Explore. More on that in just a moment. But first, Eli Glasner shows us how it's all going to work and how it fits into a changing world of streaming. But there's more than that involved in cable TV. It's the first step in the wired city of the future. The way we watch has changed dramatically since the introduction of cable TV. How do you get your entertainment? Definitely Netflix, also Disney Plus. The streaming services like Amazon, yeah. and Netflix, Mostly Disney. I spend too much time watching TV. With the arrival of streamers like Netflix and Amazon, many traded cable TV for the convenience of on-demand entertainment. As streaming has grown, so have those monthly so fees. Like, my sister and I, what we do is we actually split it. Yeah. So we're out here struggling with one screen. <laughs> now there's a new option coming to Canada. It's called FAST, free ad-supported television. Like traditional TV, it has ads, but there's no cable provider and no fees. Channels are streamed online. Today, CBC launched its own. CBC News Explore is a free 24-hour channel with commercials, news stories, original shows, including one with a familiar face. Hey there, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That. People who stream are younger. Part of the goal is connecting with a new audience. We have a number of people who consume what we produce, but they're watching in other places. And so we want to be there where they are, when they want us, on their, on their schedule. Also new to Canada, Pluto TV offers lots of shows you've seen before, as long as you don't mind the ads. And so that's very appealing to consumers, particularly in times like this where there's economic uncertainty and inflation. But the economics of Canada's smaller pool of viewers could present challenges, especially for an audience accustomed to an ad-free experience. Whether it's um, certain types of millennials or uh, Gen Zs are just not used to having to wait to then resume their content or at least having the ability to skip forward some of those ads. Although some seem game to give it a shot. We just won't have a skip button. That's fine. We can do that. <laughs> Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. All right, so let's bring in that familiar face Eli just mentioned, Andrew Chang. Welcome home, hey, my friend. Good to be back. You, you guys kept my stool here. We did, we did. I, Thank I, you for dressing up, by the way. <laughs> Are you jealous? No, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Walking around the office in jeans is pretty nice. I, I, bet, I bet it is. <laughs> so um, this show you have, About That. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been watching some of the development and getting kind of jazzed about what it's going to look like, but, but can you help me understand a bit more about that? Yeah, what, what it's about. Yeah. yeah. So well, let me start by saying that it's it's not a newscast. It's not about breaking news. Mm -hmm. So like we're not competing. We can still be Never. friends. Never. <laughs> but it it is like like I do think of it funny enough as news dressed down a little bit. Right. It's thirty minutes uh, every every weekday where we drill pretty much into one topic, like sometimes two. So we really take our time with things. We, we take the time to explain stories from top to bottom mm -hmm. and then try to find ways to expand on them. Sometimes they're fun, clever, creative ways to do that. We have a segment coming up tomorrow about 
Jenga, uh, <laughs> using Jenga blocks to explain Twitter, which is a whole other thing. But I do want to play, I, I think we have a clip that sure. I can show you, which is an episode that we shot just today, uh, all about food prices, but prices that have gone up the least hmm. over the last several years. And we filmed it almost entirely at a grocery store, also in the parking lot. Take a look. All right. Three years ago, the price per kilogram of pork shoulder was $6.67. Now in September, you know, this is the most recent data that we have, 2022, it's up to $7.32. And I managed to get this for $4.99 per kilogram. That's a pretty good deal. Pork hasn't seen the kind of increase that we've seen with, say, beef or chicken. Like beef by far is the thing that you're paying the most for. It's jumped the most. Whole chickens are okay, even things like chicken drumsticks are okay, but once you start getting into the chicken thighs, chicken breasts, that's when you're paying more today than you used to. Okay, let's move on over to fruits. And what can I say? Bananas are king. I mean, they've always been pretty affordable in price. Three years ago, a bunch of bananas per kilogram would run you about $1.60. Now it's $1.71. That's not a big fluctuation, and it's certainly less than what you'd see in terms of price hikes compared to, say, apples or oranges or grapes. Bananas, good fruit. Uh, finally, let, let's talk a little bit about vegetables. We've seen the price of produce go up pretty steadily over the last little while, so unfortunately, there's not a ton of good news on that front. Where you're gonna find the good news is in the frozen aisle. So things like frozen green beans, frozen mixed vegetables, you know, frozen corn, frozen peas. Three years ago, you could get a 750 gram bag like this for something like $2.95, 2 dollars 96 Now in September, 2022, you're looking at $3 and change, maybe $3.22. Same goes with the mixed vegetables. Unfortunately, that's just what it is. Frozen is where you're gonna find the best deals when it comes to that. If you like the convenience of it, that's great. Unfortunately, if you like fresh, you're gonna to have to pay a little bit more. Okay, I gotta jump in again. Uh, we are back here with Syl Sylvain Charlebois, who is the, uh, the head of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie. Um, okay, Sylvain, pork. Now, like as far, I know meat prices are up generally, right? Beef way up, chicken up, but why is pork? pretty steady uh well first of all uh, globally people are eating less pork uh we are uh at the start of an economic slowdown and when uh, the economy slows down people will eat uh, less animal protein and uh, and and so that's why futures are lower and prices are lower as well for our processors and retailers as well yeah so, uh, look, there's a, there's a lot to, to go through about that. You know, we've covered FTX, uh, the FIFA World Cup, Kanye West, you know, running for president. We've got a segment coming up on drill rap. Uh, never ends. Uh, listen, his banana explanation, which is coming up yeah, after which, that, is very good. That's right. It's really great to see you. I, I miss you. So it's good to, good that you're back. Do you need me to stick around to do the could moment you? with you? That would be great. Like that. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> I miss you too. So you can watch about that with Andrew Chang weekdays at 11 a.m. on our new CBC News Explore streaming service. There are a lot of ways to get there. So you can find that on CBC Gem, the CBC News app, cbcnews.ca, and on the Roku channel at 105. So here's something else that is fast, a sudden delivery with the help of a good Samaritan. She was actually the one that delivered the baby and, and caught her. The baby who just couldn't wait. Next. Look at that little cutie. That's Emma. She entered the world just a few days ago with absolute gusto. She wanted to get going on this earth so much she couldn't wait for a hospital. So because of the speed at which Emma was arriving, her parents had to make some very quick decisions on the side of a highway, how it all unfolded is our moment. I was having some contractions at home um, for about an hour. So while I was on the phone with the nurse, uh, my water actually broke and she said, okay, I think you should probably come. We only made it uh, about five minutes down the road before I pulled over. So that's when I called 911 and they told me like, sorry, sir, we cannot tell you when an ambulance is gonna be able to get to you. So when I said like, okay, well, I'm not delivering this baby by myself. 
So I kind of went right in the middle of the highway with my cell phone with the flashlight and stopped the vehicle. And so I pulled over thinking maybe he had a flat tire or something wrong with his vehicle. And said like, you know, my wife's given birth, I need help. James was still on the phone with 911. They kind of were giving him instructions. He was relaying that to Kim. Um, and then she was actually the one that delivered the baby and, and caught her. Get used to this. I, I don't even know if I can describe the joy when the baby was there and we wrapped her up and realized that she was okay and Tracy was okay. You're a real life angel and we love you. Oh, and Emma, welcome. So great thing about this, Kim says she actually has no training in this, didn't entirely know what to do, but she watches a lot of television and she got some good ideas. See, television is useful. That is a national for November the 30th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.